good. Praise the Lord for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Without the blood, we wouldn't even be here. Y'all can take a seat. Say hello to somebody you're sitting next to so it's not awkward because you're going to be with them the entire service. Hello, by the way, since you're sitting next to me the entire day. <laughs> Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. We are in a series called The Cross. Has this been a blessing to anybody? Well, thank God for five people. Uh, has this been a blessing to anybody? Mm, all right, all right. I, I might be in church. I was just checking. Praise God. Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. I heard one amen over there. My old self, that old man, that drug addict, that alcoholic, that busted up, that worth nothing, that lazy, that procrastinating, that terrible, evil man or woman is now dead because when Jesus died, he was crucified with him. That's good news for somebody. And it's no longer I who live. I, the old self. It's still the old self. I, I, I this. I want. I need. I have to have. It's all about me. That life is dead. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The original Greek actually said he lives and he dispenses his life through mine. So he's dispensing his life through my hands. My hands are his hands. His eyes become my eyes. His mouth becomes my mouth. His feet become my feet. The Bible says in Jesus's intention was for us to be little Jesuses walking around. What do you mean, little Jesus? I mean, we're supposed to be mimics of only one man, not Gavin Tate, not Pastor Marco Garcia, not your mama, not your daddy. You're supposed to only mimic one man. I strive to be like Jesus. I don't strive to be like you. Why would you lower yourself to such a small standard as to try to compare yourself to any human? We all got issues, y'all. I don't know about you. Well, I do know about you. You got issues too. We all got problems. I don't want to compare myself to somebody else who also struggles with anxiety and depression. I don't want to compare myself with somebody else who also is having a lust attack. I need to get over mine. I don't want to compare myself to somebody else. Why would I bring myself to compare? Comparison, the Bible says, is always a waste of your time. Why? Because you're missing the main point. The only one who's worthy of comparison, his name is Jesus. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me so much he gave himself for me. The cross was a love statement. The cross shouts to you, I love you. The cross shouts over to China, I love you. The cross shouts to Africa, I love you. The Christ shouts uh, to the drug addict, I love you. The cross sh uh, shouts to the divorced couple, I still love you. I want to restore you. The cross shouts to the weakest of all, to the strongest of all. The cross shouts, I love you. But you see, Galatians 1.6, Paul, the same man, one chapter earlier, says these words. I am so astonished that you have so quickly deserted the one who called you to live by the grace of Christ and you are turning to a different gospel. Do you know there's more than one gospel? There's not more than one true gospel, but do you know in churches there's different gospels being preached? Do you know that in religions there's a different gospel being preached? Do you know that it's possible to be caught up in the wrong message, in the wrong gospel? Do you know that none of us are immune to believing and to being led astray by a different gospel? Do you know that if you're not careful, if you don't keep yourself in the word of God, you can be swept up by a different gospel? You see, I'm not surprised that there's a different gospel because there's many Jesuses that are being preached right now. Of course there's many gospels. There's many Jesuses. Well, 
For instance, everybody loves the Jesus who says, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. Man, that's a great Jesus. But who knows the Jesus who shows up in the temple? Who wants the Jesus who comes and says, oh, you're bringing the world into my house? Get out! Who wants to know that Jesus says, oh, you're starting to make my house, my house which is a house of prayer, my house, this is a holy place. This isn't a place for you to bring the world and all your things. Who knows that Jesus and who wants that? Same Jesus. Many people love the Jesus who comes and says, um, come to me, those who are heavy laden. Right? My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's true. But who wants to go to the Jesus who looked at the Pharisees and said, you whitewashed tombs. He's the Jesus who calls out your hypocrisy the moment that he sees it. You see, you call them whitewashed tombs. What does that mean? You see, whitewashed tombs mean you're already dead even though you're standing here. You're talking, but you're already as good as gone. You're saying things, but I don't fall for your pretense. That's the Jesus as well. He is the Jesus who takes your burdens, but he's also the Jesus who looks at you and said, I will call you out on what is keeping you from me because I want to be close to you. I don't want this in your life anymore, and I'm not just going to be like another friend. And just remember this. Friends are not people who aid you in your toxins. Friends will always be people who take you close to Jesus, not away from him. Friends will be people who always remind you of your potential, but your enemies will always remind you of your mistakes. You see, of course, there's many gospels being preached. There's many Jesuses being preached. There's the baby, uh, the, the big daddy Jesus, you know. Um, Jesus, give me whatever I ask for whenever I ask. You know, sugar daddy. Lord, I can just say it. I'll just blab it and I'll grab it. Do I believe that your words have power? Yes. But let me tell you something. You can say all you want. You can look, you can look at yourself and say, drop 80 pounds in Jesus' name. But you'll wake up the next day with the 80 pounds. I agree. You need to speak health into your body. But you better get on a treadmill too. <laughs> There's the false grace Jesus. You know, whatever I do, I just know God will forgive me in the end. So I'm going to have my fun for a while and I'll focus on Jesus later on. The Bible says those who take the grace of God in vain have literally re-crucified Jesus again. And it's better for them that they never lived. You see, there's different Jesuses, different gospels. But the gospel that we preach is the gospel where Jesus died for us, but there's a second part. After he died for you, he hands you the cross and says, now I want you to die. You see, in many churches all over the world, the first part of the gospel is being preached. What Jesus did for you, you could have never paid for your own sin. It's good news. But now Jesus takes the cross and he hands it to you and he said, now you need to crucify your will. Your desire, your flesh. What do you mean flesh? Oh, the flesh. We'll talk about him in a moment. Isaiah chapter 14, 13 through 14, look what it says. You said in your heart, watch this, I will ascend. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned in the mount of the assembly. On the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Who is saying these words? Satan. It is no longer I who live. Your I has got to die. Because when it's all about you, when it's all about self, you see the world will preach, you need some self-love. The world will say, you just need to focus on yourself. You just need some more time with self. I just need some more self time. The Bible says crucify yourself. Die to self. Don't be sounding like the devil. 
You see, there's that flesh. You see, when you got saved, this is great news. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All things that were old have passed. You are now a new creature. All things have become new. How many are happy for that? But here's the deal. Your old life died and your sins were forgiven. But you still woke up with your flesh the next day. You see... You can cast out demons, but you can't cast out the flesh. The Bible says that the devil actually is not your problem anymore. What did James say? It said, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee. Literally, the devil comes. You submit to God. You resist him. He flees. He's not your problem. The problem is your old flesh sin that's your real enemy you see many of us we know that it's been crucified but many of us keep our old man on life support we keep him in a back room somewhere and then we bring him out we bring out the old man in the flesh come on out old man because you know we can't do these sins anymore we're Christians now I'm too proper. I have to show that I'm a great Christian, so I can't do these sins anymore. We can't look at that, but we'll send our old man. He can. Road rage. We're on the road, and uh, guys yelling at us, we can't flip him off, but go ahead, old man. It's a pinky, by the way. It's a pinky. It's a pinky. He's not doing the... He can do it. We can't scream at our wife, but I'll go ahead and pull my old man out of the closet and let him scream at her. But the old man was crucified on that cross. We can't let him come down off that cross. We got to put him where he belongs. You see, some of y'all, you're like, man, I can't cuss anymore. But you can bring him out and he'll just cuss him out. The only remedy for the flesh, the only weapon that works on the flesh is the cross. You can't rebuke the flesh. You can't preach to the flesh a sermon. You can't try to talk with the flesh. You can't try to have a consorting conversation. Let's just get reasonable now, flesh. Let, let, can we just talk for a little bit? You can't do it. All you can do is pull out the cross and crucify him. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead and he handed you a cross. Because the cross is your daily weapon against the flesh. Only the cross is strong enough to kill the things that you used to love that now are toxic for your future. I think about Abraham, Genesis 15, 1 through 4. I think about these men who God had to literally let them die even though they were still living. That's right. I'm talking today about the walking dead. Because here's what you got to understand. Jesus does not actually trust the living. He only trusts dead people. I, I get, you guys are going to have to get that. Did you hear what I just said? Jesus does not actually trust you if you're still alive. You're walking, but you're dead. He only trusts the dead. Matter of fact, the only parts of you that Jesus is able to partner with are the parts of you that have died to yourself and now allow him to live. God does not actually partner with your flesh. It's impossible. Jesus cannot partner with your flesh. So he waits for you to crucify your flesh with the power of the cross. And then every area of your life that you have crucified, he now can take over that area. Jesus does not trust the living. He only trusts the dead. But watch, Abraham, Genesis 15, 1 through 4. Let's think about him. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Don't be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you. You're my reward. Great will come. The Lord, Abraham replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are your blessings when I don't have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant of my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own. So one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir. For you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Abraham, Abram, 
It's not going to happen through the flesh. It's not going to happen through anything you want to concoct. This is going to come through the spirit. We know that Abraham tries to help God through Ishmael. Have you ever done that? You ever been guilty of trying to help God with his promises? Because you're really upset with his timing in your life. You're sitting there. I'm still single. Man, I'm upset. God, what is going on? Where are all the men at? Where are all the women at? You're sitting there. God, man, why I still got to be in this place? Nobody's even taken me out to lunch yet. And I've been at this church for three years. Nobody ever treats me kind. God, when are they going to start singing anointed songs? They all sing this stuff. And they, why won't they just listen to me? You see, we're not happy with God's timing, so we try to help him out. I'll just do it, God. I got this. Ishmael. He's your efforts. He's the symbolism of your trying to help God. But God says, no! I don't bring my promises through your strength. I bring my promises through the power of the Spirit. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my Oh, come on. It's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by my, says the Lord God. So we go two chapters later, and we see this is actually years later for Abram. And look at what Genesis 17 says. This is my covenant with you. He's talking to Abram again. It's been years. Abram is now 99 years old. Can I just pause real quick? When you're 99 years old, there's no action that's going on. You're not hot like you used to be. Let's just say that. The chance for procreating has ended. You're just trying to make it to bed without, you know, busting out a hip or something. <laughs> Notice, though, he waits till it's impossible for him to do it. I will make you a father of a multitude. What's more, I'm changing your name. It will no longer be called Abram. Instead, you're going to be called Abraham. For you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will be many, and kings will be among them. He changed his name from Abram to Abraham. You see, that symbol is pneuma. It means the spirit of God. Pause. Genesis. There is God forming out of the dust a man, a husk. No life. And then he went. <sighs> and the husk became a living being. Fast forward. Abraham, dead. Nothing. Can't do it. God goes, Abra. <sighs> and what was dead now becomes living. And he walks back and he goes, Sarah. Yo, I mean, can you imagine Sarah? She's probably trying to take a nap or something. Just get some peace. Abraham's finally gone, dear God. Whoa! I mean, she ain't heard that sound in a long time. <laughs> but the moment it hit Abram, who became Abraham, it hit Sarah. So not only did Abraham go, hey, woman, she came out, hey, baby. I think about Moses, and before I talk about Moses, let's talk one last thing about Abraham. Bible says that he now has the promise, but he goes up to the mountain in Genesis 22, and he's about to kill his son, and right as he's lifting the dagger in order to kill his son, Jesus says, stop. Why? Because God never intended for Isaac to die. He always intended for Abraham to die. He never wanted the death of Isaac. He always just wanted the death of Abraham. Abraham still walked away, but something died on that mountain. Why? Because Galatians 3 says that Abraham would become the father of our faith. 
There was too much writing on Abraham and what would come through him. That God had to test him again that he die. Again that he die. Again that he die. Again that he die. Because what God was about to bring through this man could only come through a beautiful death. You see, some of y'all won't give God something that's in your life. You're not going to give it to him. You don't know if he's going to give it back or not. You have no idea. But because you're not willing to lay it on the altar, you'll never find out. There are relationships that actually are God's will. But you know it's not the timing now, but you won't give it back to God. You have no idea. You're too worried. You don't trust God, so you hang on to it. But if you'll let the relationship die, and many of them need to die, because even though it might have started as God's will, listen to it, you have committed sin. And when sin comes into it, God rebels. He actually resists your relationship. Doesn't mean he won't give it back, but you'll never find out. You see, this is what I figured out when I married my wife. Because Ashley, her and I dated for three months, and I knew she was with my wife. But I got to tell you, she broke up with me. She said, I'm sorry, you're too sure about this. You're a little intense for me. You're like calling me. You know that I'm your wife and everything. I don't know that. I just don't want to lead you on. So she broke up with me for an entire year. We didn't talk. A whole year. I'm out there with my guitar writing the greatest songs, though, in the world. I'll tell you that. When you go through a breakup, man, you got great songs. Oh, you know. <laughs> I'm just speaking in tongues, writing songs. Oh, and I'm speaking in tongues because I'm trying to be spiritual. You know, like, you know, like, Lord, I just pray for the greatest husband for her and all that. You don't mean none of that. You still love her. Don't act like you mean that. So I would just be like, shut up, up, because literally I knew if I started praying, I'd be like, bring her back. This woman's losing her mind. But I'd be praying, you know, God, you know, yeah, yeah. so what did I have to do? I remember the day God said, let it die. On the altar. But you know what? I had been in one relationship prior to Ashley. Only one. I'd never dated. I'd never kissed a girl. I was 23 years old. I had saved myself completely for my wife. And I thought that this woman was my wife. I met her in Australia. I dated her. Uh, we were together. She was not my wife. It was definitely not God. But I could not let go of it for five years. So I literally was the first time I would ever say in my life that I felt depressed. I never felt that before. It took my father, Brother Ivan Tate, coming into my room one day. I hadn't showered for 10 days. I did not care. This is my early 20s, y'all. This is like almost 20 years ago. So please, just know this wasn't yesterday or something. <laughs> I'm just telling you my journey, okay? I had to let it die. All right. So I'm there, and I'm just whatever. And my dad says these words to me I'll never forget. He said, son, and I looked at him, and I remember I mocked him to his face. I said, preach it, dad. Go ahead. Tell me whatever you want to say. Preach it. I said, I know you want to say something. Just say it, dad. Like, it was bad. And he looks at me, and he goes, son, this woman controls your joy. This woman controls whether or not you're going to be in your calling. This woman controls, and she hasn't talked to you for almost five years. And you are making this woman an idol in your life. And you're telling Jesus that he does not matter and he's not enough for you. <laughs> the moment he said that, I fell on my face. And I started weeping. And out of repentance, out of repentance, I was totally made new. Because I had to remove a person off of the idol. I had to remove the person off of the throne. And Jesus was back on the throne. Do you know it wasn't three months later that Ashley came into my life? So let me fast forward. We're going into that whole year. We're broken up now. And I'm just like, Lord, this woman's crazy, but I'm going to act like she's not because I've been wrong before because of this relationship. So, Lord, maybe I'm wrong again. So I said, God, and I truly let it die. Like three months later, it's, it was one year to the day that we broke up. The very day, one year later, I get a text. And we get together. She talks to me at this place called the World Prayer Center. I was like, this is a very spiritual location. <laughs> and she's like, I've been fasting for the last four days. And she said, um, I've got to talk to you. And she read for an hour everything that the Lord had told her. And then she said this. 
She said, God told me at the very end of the speech, James 1.17 was my scripture for you. Now, if you'd understand, when I was born, I was born mentally retarded. I had water inside of my lungs and my brain. I was blind. I was supposed to die. I was on a respirator for the first eight weeks of my life. I had muscle atrophy and couldn't move. I was going to be bound to a wheelchair my entire life. I did not have a voice for the first two years of my life because my vocal cords were completely destroyed. So I'm a human miracle. However, when I came out of the womb, my dad saw a scripture, which is my life scripture, James 1, 17. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, who there's no shadow of turning. So here's the deal. She had no idea about this. She, she looks at me and she says, oh, there's one more thing. God said you're my James 1, 17. When she said it, my hair stood up, goosebumps all over me, and that moment I knew it was not man who was giving it back to me, but it was God who was giving it back to me. You see, let me tell you something. If you try to hold on to things, you're going to be the one to blame for whether it messes up later. But if God's the one who brings it back, no devil can come against your marriage. No devil can come against it all because you know God's the one who did this. Nothing can tear this apart. You want it to be God who does it. You don't want it to be you. I think about Moses. A murderer running for his life out in the wilderness. The Bible said, God comes to him, you're going to deliver my Israelites. What does he say? I can't speak well. He had to die to his excuses. Some of y'all have too many excuses. Today's the day you got to die. That's got to die. Lord, you don't know my past. Don't you know that God knew everything about you when he saved you? He knows what he's getting himself into. You don't have to remind him about all the ways and the reasons why you're not ready. You know what else he died to? His fear. He was scared spitless. He had to die to his fear. Some of y'all have been intimidated for too long. That needs to die today. I think about David. David was a man who was out there in the middle of a field with sheep. That's a comfortable place. Writing his songs, playing his little harp. But one day there was a giant that defied the armies of God, and he was not going to stand for it. So he gave up the comfort of his other life and said, now if you want me to be a giant killer, I don't care that I'm a teenager. If you're a teenager, you know you ain't got to wait to be used by God. It's time for you to be used. You know besides Matthew, every single disciple was a teenager besides Matthew who was around 23 to 25. Exactly. Jesus is being followed by teenagers, y'all. How about Paul? I think about Paul, a killer of Christians. He gave a lot of things. The Bible said he was beaten with rods at least three times. The Bible said that he was thrown into prison over and over and over again. And many of the letters that we read, he's in prison while he's writing them. He's literally in chains with a candle as he's writing words like this. What can separate us from the love of God? So depth or height or width or what, what can, can the sword, can anything separate us? Even through all this, I am more than a conqueror. Through Christ who loved me with chains on his hands. You see, Paul said, if I were to still care about pleasing people, I could not be called an apostle of Jesus Christ. Some of y'all need to die to people's approval. Some of y'all are approval addicts. You are addicted to people's approval. You are addicted to your mom's approval. You're addicted to your dad's approval. You're addicted to your brother's approval. Some of y'all are addicted. Well, if your mama don't like it, oh, I just, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I said this in the first serve. I'm going to say it again. Some of you are grown men. You're 45 years old, but you're still connected to the umbilical cord of your mother. <laughs> Nothing wrong with her, and it's not her fault. It's your fault. Romans 6, verse 7, 10 through 14. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. When we died, we were set free. Did you see that? When we die, we experience freedom. When we die, we experience freedom. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also, listen to it, should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control your body. Do not give into your sinful desires. In other words, you have a part to play. You get to decide whether yourself and your flesh are going to win that day. Don't let it win. He said, you have power over this. 
Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil. Instead, give yourself completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. Your old man died, and now it is Jesus who lives through you. Sin no longer is your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom, the freedom, the freedom, the freedom, the freedom. There's freedom. There's freedom in the power of God's grace. Some of y'all are getting this. This girl's getting it right here. Some people are getting it right here. I see you getting it right there. You got to see, there's a moment that this is going to hit you, that you're going to realize the greatest life you've ever been seeking. It's not anybody else's fault that you don't have it. Stop blaming everybody else for the things you don't have. You got to understand, it's only one death away. The greatest life you've ever had is only one death away. Galatians 3, 3 through 4. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the spirit, why are you trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? You see, you see, you couldn't even gotten saved without the Holy Ghost. Did you know that? If the Holy Ghost didn't draw you, you wouldn't even be able to receive Jesus. So now you receive Jesus and you stand there like many Christians and say, I got this now, God. I got it. Watch me. Watch me show you how great of a Christian I can be. That's called religion. You saved me. I couldn't have done it on my own. But now watch me go for it. Watch me do this. That's called religion. It separates us from God. He says, don't you know? You see, every single sermon that Jesus preached, no person could follow it. Because Acts chapter 2 had not happened yet. You see, they saw him walk on water. They saw him heal the leper. They saw him calm the storm and say, peace, be still, and the storm was calmed. They saw him heal. They saw him take five loaves and two fish and break it and feed over fifteen to 20,000 people. But the moment they came to arrest Jesus, they all deserted him. Because a miracle is not enough. Without the Holy Ghost, it won't touch you. The word is not enough. Without the Holy Spirit, you won't even be able to understand it. There's all that you can see everything. But without the Holy Ghost, you can't even receive the word. You can't even know because of the Holy Ghost. You see, it is impossible for you to fulfill what God is asking you to do. Can I just say that? I'm going to say it again because you got to get this. It is impossible for you, sir, ma'am, to fulfill what God has asked you to do, period. But through the power of the Holy Ghost and with grace, which is the ability to go beyond your own ability, you can do it. Good luck trying to become pure on your own without the Holy Ghost. Good luck. Good luck trying to get over drugs and alcohol on your own without the power of God. Good luck. Good luck on trying to be a person who stops snitching and gossiping on people by yourself. you got to stop being a gossip. But I promise you, if you gossip for long enough, you ain't just going to be able to stop overnight without the power of the Holy Spirit. Because he's got to take over your mouth. Some of y'all got tongues that are 30 and 40 feet long. The Holy Ghost got to come and snip your tongue. <laughs> Woo! Luke 9, 22 through 26, I got to keep moving. The Son of Man, I'm, just, I'm not going to read it to you. It says this, will suffer many things. Whoever wants to be my disciple, come on, must take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. You see, the cross... The cross is an intersection. The cross literally has two intersections. This is how you pick up your cross daily. This is how you do it. There is a moment in every day when your will and God's will cross. There's a moment in every day where your will and God's will cross. You get to decide whose will wins. If you pick up God's will... You have now borne your cross in that moment. You've taken up your cross. There's a moment for every single one of us. You'll leave this building today. You'll have an opportunity to yell at your wife. Or you could take up God's will. You have an opportunity to do it all. But God's going to give you an opportunity. Your will and God's will is going to cross. That's how we take up our cross. We choose the will of God. You see, the cross means to suffer. The cross means self-death. 
The devil tried to get Jesus to pass up the cross three different times, y'all. The first one was when? In the wilderness, remember? He tries to get Jesus to pass up the cross in the wilderness. He's there and the devil comes to him and says, um, if you'll just make these stones into bread, if you'll just bow down to me, I'll give you all this city. Jesus gives him the word. Get behind me. So now the devil knows that it's not going to work to come specifically himself to Jesus. But you know what he does next? If the devil can't get you to fall, if the devil can't get you to commit adultery, if the devil can't convince you of the lie, he'll send somebody who loves you to say the lie. The second time he tried to get him to pass up the cross was with Peter. You're not going to go to the cross, Jesus. He said, get behind me, Satan. You see, the most dangerous person in the world is a good person with wrong beliefs. The third way that he tried to get Jesus to pass up the cross, Jesus was actually on the cross. It said a Pharisee was there before Jesus died and said, if you really are the son of God, come off of that cross. Who was it but the devil? You know why? Because the Bible says if the enemy would have known what he was doing, he never would have crucified Jesus. Because your death is the destruction of Satan's plan in your life. Your death is the destruction of Satan's hold on your life. Your death is the destruction of Satan's future for your life. When Jesus died, it said he humbled himself, even past all the form of a man, even unto death. And God has now given him the name above every name. You see, authority comes through death. Freedom comes through death. Power comes through death. There are two voices. In just a moment, I'm going to talk about those. But Romans 8.35, can anything separate us from Christ's love? Can death, does it mean no, love, no longer loves us because we have trouble or calamity? Does he no longer love us because we are persecuted, we're hungry, we're destitute, or we're in danger? Or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through him who loved us. What is Paul saying? Nobody wants persecution. Nobody likes trouble. That's not like the best Christian message. You wouldn't probably come to hear that. Nobody likes calamity. Nobody wants to experience hunger, destitution, or danger, or be threatened with death. Nobody likes that. But here's what he's saying. If you're dead lying in the casket, do you care who's gossiping about you? If you're dead lying in the casket, do you care who's trying to threaten you with death? Paul says, I'm already dead. Persecute me all you want. Threaten me with death all you want. Give me whatever you want to do. I've already died. I'm a walking dead. I'm a walking dead. I'm a walking dead. I've died to my own will. I've died to my own life. I buried that a long time ago. You can threaten me. I don't care. You can try to offend me. You're not going to push my buttons anymore because I don't care about my own reputation anymore. I care about the reputation of Jesus Christ. See, some of y'all need to die to trying to defend yourself. Some of y'all are trying to justify yourself. Some of y'all are defending yourself. Let God defend you. You're dying to your own life. You're dying to your own life. You're dying to pleasing yourself now to please God. You're dying to your own schedule. You're dying to your own commitments. You're now trusting God with the direction and his timing in your life. You're dying to your own methods. You're dying to your own strength. You're fully depending on God to work through you, partnering together to achieve what he asked you to do. Why do I say that? Because Philippians 2.13, for it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work, that is to strengthen, to energize, creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill his good purpose for his good pleasure. What does that mean? It means you're not going to do it on your own. God will not only give you the desire, he's going to give you the follow through. He's going to give you the power. Some of y'all have had the desire, but you can't follow through. It's time today to get the follow through. It's time today to get the power. You've come today to be equipped with the power, the power of the cross, and you got to use it on your flesh. See, there's two voices that are in our life, and I'm closing with this. There are two voices always speaking in our life. One, the flesh, which operates through comfort and leads us away from risk and inconvenience. The flesh will always operate with what's the most comfortable. Or there's a second voice, the voice of God. 
It operates through faith. Feeds on discomfort. Feeds on discomfort. In order to truly achieve victory. It's usually a path of pain. It often seems lonely at times. But it is the only path that leads to an exciting and fully satisfying life. What do you mean satisfying life? I mean John 10, 10. The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came. I came to give them life. A life that only comes through death. And have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. John 12, 24 through 25. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new ones. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. If we could play that track. Every person, as you came in, you should have received a seed. If you have not received a seed, there's going to be ushers that are here in the aisles in just a moment to help you get that. But I want you to take that seed in your hand. And I'm going to have two altar calls today, very simply. Two altar calls. And remember, please do not move in this moment. This is a precious moment to God. Because what's about to happen is something is about to be born brand new in your life, even if you're a Christian. Number one, I just want to ask, have you given your life to Jesus? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you're going to heaven? Do you know that if you died for some reason, God forbid, you'd wake up in front of the face of Jesus? Do you have, do you have peace with God? You can't buy peace with God. You can't have enough cars. You can't have enough houses. You can't have enough girlfriends or people peace with God is something that only God can give through his son Jesus if you say that's me I don't know Jesus but this is my day I need you on one two three to stand up right now and walk over right here to the front come right now give him a hand I don't want you to wait if you say I want Jesus come up to the front right now I want Jesus look at him coming right now give him a hand give her a hand give him a hand right now give him a hand give him a hand thank you Jesus come right up to the front to me look at me look at me right here in the front Come on, everybody look at me. Face me, come on up, come on, give my hand, look at him coming. Look at him coming. Yes, baby. Guys, hello, come on, right here. Thank you, Jesus, you can just face this way. Everybody face in this direction. Thank you, God, they're still coming, they're still coming. Give my hand as they're still coming. Now, if you guys would scoot down just this way, just a little bit, scoot down right here. Praise God. Just scoot right over here. Thank you so much. This is what we're going to do now. I want, uh, Usher, if you could hold this. Could you just hold this this time instead of it being on the stage? Hold it there. You get one more. Oh, man. If you could just hold it here and stand out among them just there so nobody will get crowded in here. Let's do it on the same on this side. So we're going to hold it this time. If I could get two helpers right here, two ushers or helpers, come and hold this. Thank you, my man. Stand out there. Come on up to the front, guys. We're going to say this prayer together, every single one of us. And we're going to say this prayer because your life matters. And if you come up to the front, we thank you so much. What's going to happen after you say this prayer is there's going to be somebody who's going to come and talk to you and ask you about the next steps. Next step is called next steps, starting at the way. And we're going to talk to you. We want you to get baptized. We want to help you. We want to become a family for you now. Thank you guys for hearing the message today. But every single one of us, let's say this prayer out loud. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, make sure you say it up here for short. Dear Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I thank you for your blood, which has washed me clean. I'm asking you to take me as your child, make me a disciple. I leave my old life behind, and I'm brand new. From this moment forward, I will go to heaven when I die. I will go to heaven when I die. And in Jesus' name, I want you to be my boss. Help me become a disciple. Give him a hand right now. Give him a hand right now. Listen, man, it's that simple. You guys just said a prayer. What's up, guys? 
You guys just said a prayer. This prayer, because you mean it with your heart. The Bible said you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that you are saved. Jesus is Lord. You're now saved. So now you have a brand new future. What's up, man? Dude, thank you, man. You have a brand new future. But what's going to happen is now you got to take the next step for discipleship. This is what's going to go on. If you want to stay up here, that's totally fine. Everybody just right here. This is the next call right here. If you have that seed in your hand, there are now people that are holding a bucket that has soil. There's one here, one there, one there, one there. This is what I want you to do. The Bible says that you can't just die to something. you got to die to your own dreams. That seed in your hand represents your dream. I'm asking you, and you know what? If you say, I can't do this, Gavin, I'm just going to hold on to my seed, no problem. Let God show you the timing of this. But for many people today, you are saying, I'm going to let my dream die. Unless a seed falls in the ground and dies, God cannot make it into a harvest. You see, your dreams are your ambitions, your strong desires, the things that you've made plans for. Right now, as we're here, I want you, if you have that seed, to walk up to the front and plant it in this dirt, and then you are dismissed to go. Be serious about this. This is a powerful moment. You are bringing up your dream and saying, God, I want your dream. Maybe your dream is God's dream, but let him prove it to you. Let him show you. Turn up that music. Okay. If you guys right here who came up to receive Jesus as well, you can scan this code. I just got saved and take your next steps as well. Come on. You're putting your seed. You're putting your seed. Bring your dream. What is it? What are your plans? What are your dreams that you've put up here? What are your dreams? Bring them up. Let Jesus give you his dream. Let Jesus give you his desire. Put it in that soil. Push it down into that soil. Push it down into that soil. I lay down my dream, God. I want your dream. Unless a seed dies, God will not be able to give you what he has. He wants to give you the very best. The path to the most satisfying and abundant life is the path of death. But it's a beautiful death. Jesus is with you. On the cross, he died for you. But now he hands you the cross. And he says, you have the power to crucify that which is keeping you from the promise. You have the power. The cross is in your hand. Look at all these people putting these seeds. Look at all these people. These are your dreams. The dreams for your families. The dreams for your own life your own personal ambitions. There are seeds up here. If you do not have one, grab them from there. Your own personal ambitions. Look at these people putting their seed. If you're watching us today, I want you to be doing this symbolically with us. I want you right now, you can walk up to the screen. Walk up to your television screen, put your hand on your phone, whatever it is, and say, Lord God, I just thank you, I agree. My life, my dream, I want your dream. God, I'm giving up all my own ways. Teach me how to depend on your strength. Just do that right now, wherever you're at. There'll be a thousand, two thousand people watching right now. I want you right now, participate. Come put your hand on the screen, put your hand on the phone. I'm agreeing with you in Jesus' name that what you are asking God to do, he is doing through you. All of these people are putting down that seed. Scan this barcode if you want to take the next steps and you just got saved. This is beautiful right now beautiful right now thank you Lord pastor Marco is preaching this Wednesday for everybody he's gonna be here this Wednesday it's gonna be powerful continuing on the cross and what he wants to speak on man I just love this moment right now thank you Lord thank you Lord can you feel the power of what's going on right now lay it down Lay it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for being a part of the move of God. What you're doing right now, the Holy Spirit sees. Jesus loves this. He sees what you're doing. He's going to take you at your promise. He's going to take you at your word. 
I promise you're not laying down anything that God will not give you more. When you lay down your dream, God's dream was always bigger. God's dream was always greater. He will do exceedingly above all we could have asked, thought, or imagined. But it's got to die. Maybe some of y'all are putting in your seed for a relationship that has to die. Maybe some of y'all, I feel that some of y'all are putting in a seed for a relationship that you know needs to die. I promise, let God raise to life the right thing for you, the right person, the right dream, the right place, the right time. This is powerful, man. I see people weeping as they're putting these seeds in. This is not a moment that just passes by. This is a sacred moment to God. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm still on the stage. Because I want you to know I'm with you. I want you to know we as a church, we're here with you. The way is here to support. The way is a family for you. You're not giving up anything. The Lord will give you more. He'll give you greater. He'll give you better. But you got to give it. You got to make this declaration today. We're here to do the journey with you. We're here to walk it out with you. You have a family. The family of Jesus, the family of Christ, the Wayworld Outreach. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. The cross, the walking dead. You're walking, but you're walking out, walking dead. You're walking, but you're walking out. Your will has died. Jesus, not my will, your will be done. Jesus, not my will in my marriage, your will be done. Jesus, not my will in my job, my own office, my, my things I pursue, God. You see, the Bible says that a man or woman plans a way in his heart, but the Lord determines his steps. A man or woman plans the way in his heart, but the Lord determines his steps. You got to have a plan, but then you give the plan to the Lord. Say, God, is this your plan? What do you want to change about it? What do you want to do about this? What do you want to shift about this? People are putting their dreams. People are putting their own ambitions. Let God show you. Let him lead you. You want God's plan. Trust me, you don't want your own. Any plan apart from the Holy Spirit is going to be less than. Any, any, any goal apart from what God wants to give you is going to be less than. You want God. You want God's best. Bless you, sir. Bless you. Thank you, guys. This is a sacred moment. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is important. That's why I'm here with you. God sees, thank you. God's seeing everything you're doing. This is the Lord right now. This is a life-changing moment for somebody here. You'll never forget this day. You'll never forget this day. I love it how some people are just sitting here praying and watching because it's a powerful atmosphere right now. It's a beautiful thing. Hallelujah. I agree with you, brother. I agree with you, brother. Whatever you're putting down in faith, I know that God is going to give it to you tenfold. He's going to give it back the best way. He's going to give. Whatever you lay down, he gives it back. Press down, shaking together, running over. But I'm telling you, you got to die. This has got to die. Allow Jesus to show you what his will is for you. Allow him to give you the greatest. Allow him to give you the best. Thank you, everyone, on that side. This is moving forward really great.